Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Buzzcast. We appreciate all the support we've been getting recently. And today we'll be talking about housing financing with Roger Steger. Roger is the founder of PGain LLC, an investor, academic, and philanthropist. Joan, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Jim. Well, Roger, it's good to see you. It's been a while since we've seen each other up close and personal. And I see you're sporting a, a, a COVID hairdo, too. I do. I enjoy my COVID hair. It's my commitment that I will not cut it until COVID is over. Okay. Well, I'm I'm kind of envisioning you with dreadlocks the next time I see you. So let's talk about a little housing finance today. I've been amused. Maybe maybe that's not a good choice of words. Concerned and amused at the feeding frenzy over refinances. And of course, this is not a new phenomenon, but it does seem to be uh, accelerated, ironically, in the in the midst of this pandemic. Let's talk about personal finance rather than what's going on at the uh, investor level. What's your advice to a consumer? When is it appropriate to refinance and when is it a bad idea? Well, one, it's an honor to be here with you, John. It, it always is. And it's also very timely that we're having this discussion because we're just at the end of January. And why is that so timely for a refinance? Well, most people haven't filed their taxes, but yet by the end of January, have all the materials to file their taxes. So if you are considering a refinance and you actually had better performance in 2019 rather than 2018, it's a good chance or a good time to refinance because you can file an extension for 2020 and only report your 2019. So it might create a good opportunity for individuals who do COVID, they had some COVID issues, they believe they're going to have a better opportunity to refinance, you know, without 2020 tax returns. So it, it is timely. I would also state that the current interest rates are at historic lows. And one of the things we say in finance is always use the lowest cost of capital and debt is the lowest cost of capital. So if you have the ability to refinance and we'll talk about what you wanna do with those proceeds, now is a good opportunity because of the low interest rates. What I do not recommend on a personal, this is gonna be interesting due to COVID. What I do not recommend on a personal finance perspective is doing a cash out refi and consuming the new capital. And the reason I say that is it's very timely. If you have COVID issues, if you've lost your position, if you've had an income issue, then yes, okay? Certainly if you have the health issue of a parent, of a child, or of yourself, absolutely use the, the capital. But fight using the capital for what I'll call standard of living creep or to maintain standard of living. You know, if you're not taking a holiday, which most people aren't, you know, due to COVID, et cetera, that's okay. But if you do the cash out refi, okay, fight consuming that capital unless it is an emergency. Now, what you might want to do, and I would highly recommend this with a cash out, or not a cash out, but with a refinance, is a restructuring of your current mortgage. So if you were at a higher rate, you could go to a lower rate and potentially a smaller tenor of the mortgage. All of that would benefit you as a consumer. But just remember that refinance is very surgical. It is definitely not one size fits all. It should not be done in a vacuum with you and a mortgage broker or you with a mortgage banker. You should be working, if you have a wealth advisor, working with your wealth advisor, we're certainly considering the larger aspect to a refi because while it seems great to get quote unquote free money or use of your free money, it can also be dangerous. And that danger may not be today. It could be five years from now. It could be 10 years from now. That was a, that was a long answer. So. No, I, I, you know, we, we definitely as Americans have started this trend, um, I mean, who who knew that we would have continuing see interest rates just continuing to go down for as, as long as they have? And every year we keep saying, oh, the refinance wave is over yet. You know, here we are again. But this one 
there's a lot about what's going on right now that reminds me a little bit of 2005 and 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 six in terms of the the climate escalating sale prices and actually let's talk about that for a little bit because is it your opinion that sale price and value have diverged and ergo appraisers are more important than ever? Let me start with the last part of your question. I, I would say that appraisers are the unsung hero of the real estate industry. And I would say that appraisers, in my opinion, are vilified and they should not be. They should be embraced. Because an appraiser who does their job well, and, and we can talk about the ones that don't, but why? We'll talk about the ones who do their job well, benefit everyone. They tell the, they tell the seller the current clearing price. They tell the buyer the current clearing price. They tell Freddie and Fannie, the mortgage lenders, the current price and what they should lend on. So I would say right there that they are the unsung heroes. And one of my favorite expressions in the mortgage industry, or I should say in finance, and we're talking about, so architects generally are not used in, in, in residential or consumer finance. But I always say two of the brightest individuals in real estate transactions are the architects and the appraisers. But then who gets paid the least in a real estate transaction? Architects and appraisers, which makes me go back to my original, my original statement, are they truly the brightest if they're getting paid the least? So I, I fully believe that you need to embrace the appraiser and get an independent assessment of what the home, whether you're selling or whether you're buying, is. So, Roger, the first part of the question was, you know, has there been a divergence between price and value, more or less no differently than what's going on in the stock market today? What has bothered me the most about what is going on today, what it went on in 2006, 2007, 2008, and we could actually argue has continued from 6, 7, and 8 to today is if you look at median household income okay, versus medium home prices, basically we have priced out the American dream. The American dream is no longer within grasp of the millennials. And, and it goes back to when I talk to, I talk to lots of my students and you know, I read a lot of articles about the shifts in desires of millennials. And, you know, again, mine is not a scientific survey. It's just with you know, academic graduate students typically, but the dreams haven't changed. The reason there's a shift in focus is because there's an inability to afford the dream due to income levels. So I do think that there is a disparity between price and value. And, and I think it's very sad. And I think it is something that the regulators need to address. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, let's come back to that after we break for this uh, commercial message. Jim? Thanks, Joan. Appraisers, if you've grown frustrated with endlessly pursuing new appraisal work and not reaping any of the benefits, Metro West is here to help. They understand and work to alleviate the pain points commonly felt by appraisers to enable personal and financial growth for their staff. After all, they've been owned and operated by appraisers since the company opened in 1987. Metro West Appraisal is an equal opportunity employer, and they're always looking for certified residential real estate appraisers to join their team. Visit metrowestappr.com slash careers or email careers at metrowestappr.com. Joan, back to you. Thank you, Jim. So let's talk about regulation, legislation. Uh, sounds like a terribly dry topic, but the timing is we do have a new administration, and Biden is very focused, um, believe it or not, in the appraisal space. Uh, what would your advice be to the incoming uh, administration on how to appropriately uh, provide oversight of housing finance? Well, the big issue would be, I think they need to embrace appraisals. Okay, Freddie Fannie not looking at 100% of the appraisals, not requiring 100% of the appraisals, appraisal index, I think is a problem. 
you know, I still do not understand how you can lend on an item where you don't know the actual price or value. And that's what appraisers provide. Now, I just heard the commercial about Metro West. Great organization, and I wanted to comment on that. One of the issues I think with that we have with, not I think, this is my opinion, is the median age of appraisers is getting large. Appraisers are becoming the spotted owls, okay? And they're going to die off. What I would like when we talked about, you know, regulatory revamp is I would like a revamp of MAI you know, the five years to become an MAI is indentured servitude, okay? You're asking a millennial who already is not making enough money to afford a house to go out and work in the housing industry as an indentured servant, in my opinion, for the five years. Now, it'd be one thing, in my opinion, if MAI kept the five years, but there should be credit for some senior individuals to enter to become appraisers for recognition of excellence. For instance, RICS, Royal Institute of Chart or Chartered Surveys, you know, ha have, a, have an M and have an F. The F is for fellows. The way you get fellows is that you have longer expertise. I think MAI needs to embrace something like that and increase their ranks. Because think about it, it would be very difficult to go and become an MAI second in your career. If you're 40 years old and want to make a career transition, you're basically asking someone at age 40 to go back to a salary that somebody earns between 20 and 25. It's just not going to work. There needs to be other avenues for appraisers. Now, I agree. I, I always hate it when everything comes to money, but the requirements uh, are, are too great. The barriers are tremendous and the pay is awful. And um, that is a formula for disaster. And everybody complains that we don't have, A, we're not growing new ones, as you said. And then the ones who uh, uh, remain in the profession are, are really struggling. And it's, um, it's, it's just a bad mix. So unfortunately, it is all about the money. And uh, we definitely need to fix that for sure. Uh, let's break one more time for a commercial message, and then we'll be right back. Thanks, Joan. In uncertain times, you need a certain partner. You don't have to sacrifice top-notch coverage for an affordable premium. Intercorp has all the options and is sure to have just the right one to fit your specific needs. They provide the appraisal profession with competitive, best-in-class, ENO coverage solutions nationwide. Having served the insurance needs of the industry for more than 25 years, Intercorp understands the risks you face every day. Whether you're an individual appraiser, appraisal firm, residential, commercial, or an AMC, visit intercorpinc.net to get a competitive quote today. Joan? Thank you, Jim. So, Roger, let's talk a little bit about collateral risk. You know, that's a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart. And um, again, back to that theme of this looks so 2005 to me, we have right now a 20% default rate, which I understand is about two times what it was uh, in the last crisis. And once again, uh, in the last crisis, we learned how to kick the can down the road. They've kicked the forbearance can down the road till the end of February. What do you see how this forbearance picture uh, playing out? this time. Did we learn anything from the last crisis? Yes, we've learned how to kick the can better down the road. Okay, I, I would say that we've learned quite a bit. What concerns me is the lack of accountability, the lack of willingness to actually face and solve the problem. And, and, and if you look at it from a politician's perspective, how do you get elected? You give away free money. So you know, what happens? People continue to give away free money. One of the issues that I have, and this is really more of an academic perspective, when we talk about collateral risk and we talk about kicking the can, is very few individuals can actually define risk. They can talk about it qualitatively. Well, you know, risk is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But to be able to, how do we manage? How do we value? How do we protect? How do we prevent? an item that we can't even define, okay? The simple definition of risk is deviation from a central location, okay? That deviation can be positive, that deviation can be negative. 
It doesn't mean positive and negative is good. I'm not saying positive is good, negative is bad, but we need to be able to define it. And then how do you quantify it? There is a standard, standard deviation equation, which I won't bore the listeners with right now, but we can actually quantify it. So I would say that we need a new educational system. And, you know, let me throw out this crazy idea. Maybe there should be an exam for getting a government-backed mortgage so that you truly understand the product that you are taking because it is a 30-year commitment. So that's another, you know, again, I say that for credit cards, you know, students that go to academic campuses and then are bombarded with credit cards, you're being asked to take the most risk from the least knowledgeable individuals of risk. And there's just a problem. Now, there, there is a, a, a big disconnect. I, I do hope that we have learned that we don't want to open the floodgates on the forbearances and, and put, you know, millions of people out in their homes. But it would seem to me, regardless of how it's handled, we're going to have a, a reset and we're going to lose. And again, this is always concerns me back to that topic earlier of refinancing. Don't take that cash out, and as you said, unless you absolutely need it for medical reasons. But don't don't do it to buy the new Yukon or uh, buy some GameStop stock uh, on, on, with your Robinhood account and um, and and go crazy. So you know, it just sounds to me like Roger, both you and I are in favor of just uh, having a rational system and. Uh, Markets seem to be behaving irrationally right now, and the regulators aren't seeming to tamper, tamp that down at all. One thought or, or, or one statement I, I would like to make is housing is not an entitlement. Because you were born into the U.S., you were a U.S. citizen, you are not entitled to own a home. Look at Europe. Most actually rent. When you look at it from you know, an economy of scale perspective, often you were better off renting. You know, one of the people that I admire the most is Mike Anakey, former head of the uh, real estate program at Johns Hopkins. You know, he never owned a piece of real estate. And when I asked him, I said, Mike, you're head of the program. He's like, Roger? Um, and I, I know Mike very, very well. He is an avid investor. He's like, every time I ran the numbers, I was better off investing. And you know what? When you go back, often you are. So, so this entitlement has to end. You know, maybe people are better off renting. There's nothing wrong with renting. Now, is there a pride of ownership? That's a whole different podcast, and I believe there is. But but there is no entitlement of real estate. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And when you say that, though, people look at you like uh, that's that's not very democratic. But what I think is not very democratic is putting people in a home that they cannot afford because that will end well. And then, you know, here we are. So, well, with that, Roger, let's uh, wrap this up. Do you have any final parting thoughts for the real estate appraiser community out there? I have a final thought based on, on what you just said. And the, the, the shocking word I'm going to say is perversion. Okay. There is a perversion in mortgage finance. And I'll tell you exactly what it is. You qualify for a mortgage on income, but you pay for a mortgage with cash. Okay. The two are not the same. So, you know, one of the issues when we get into forbearance, one of the issues when we get into homes you can't afford, it's because you based everything on an accounting number, which is income. You didn't base it on a cash number, which is real. So that, I think, needs to be one of the issues that we correct, is the perversion of qualification with income, but payment with cash. Income doesn't equal cash. Excellent. Uh, excellent point. Okay. Well, thank you, Roger, for joining us today on this podcast. And uh, we hope to see you live and in person real soon. Perfect. Perfect. All right, but not, the hair will not be shorter unless COVID is gone. <sighs> okay. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Thank that you. was a really interesting topic. Everyone, please remember to subscribe and comment below. Have a great day. When was the last time you wanted to work more for less money? 
The appraisal industry is headed that way. You have to do more for the same amount of money, and now you have less time for yourself. Data Master can change that. With their easy to use software, Data Master lets you spend more time analyzing and less time typing. Plus, you get more information than other data import products give you. Head to datamasterusa.com slash buzz for more information and to learn how you can save an hour per report. Get more time, do what you want with Data Master.